Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You ever feel that way? Yes. You know, we have a lady that works at the DMV, but I think she's going to miss services this weekend. I'm going to have to send that to her. <laughs> Special delivery. So, glad you're here this morning. Um, today we're talking about giving it time. And a lot of times when people have been through something difficult or they've had a failure or somebody has attacked them, or maybe they had a death in the family or some type of trauma. A lot of times, listen, we are, we are in a hurry as Americans all the time. We are so used to things being so quick. And God is never in a hurry. And healing takes time. We usually understand that physically. We, we understand when we break a bone that we have to wear a cast. And by the way, do you know why they put a cast on you? Because they don't trust you. They, they think you're going mean, to, I'm serious, they, they don't trust you. They, they can put something that you could take off if they could trust you. They don't trust you, so they put something on there that you can't mess with. Ask a nurse, sometime when you're with a nurse, say, could you probably do something that we could remove? Oh yeah, yeah, we could do that. But you guys are stupid, and you will <laughs> take it off. That's a word you're not supposed to use. All right. Well, my mom's not here this morning. All right. So let me ask you a question. What do you want your life to look like? Would you like to be more frustrated than you are? Would you like to be more impatient? All of us know a really impatient person. Would you like to be more impatient? Would you like to walk through life with anger and frustration all the time? Other than Bob, most of us would say no, right? The truth is, all of us want to go through life, and really, and a lot of us see ourselves this way. We want to be gracious to people. We want to be patient with people. We want to listen to people when they talk. You know, some of us feel like that rabbit. If you're ADD like me, you feel like that all the time with other people. You're like, does your brain really move that slow? Are you serious? Really? Especially at the DMV, right? <laughs> or do you want to be a person that people think of somebody who listens and cares? When's the last time you actually looked somebody in the eye? When you took time to just, hey, maybe even pick up the phone and hear a voice on the other end of the phone. It takes a little more time. But here's the deal. If we want to grow, if we want to become a person that's loving and patient and, and can go through life, we have to allow, as God is working us through the pain in our life and the difficulties and the trials and the failures in our life, we have to realize that God will use time. And that time is our friend, and it's not our enemy. And so too often we get in a hurry, and because we get in a hurry, we miss all kind of opportunities. We go through life frustrated and stressed out because we're always in a hurry, and we don't enjoy the moments. Let me give you a simple example. The other night I was getting ready to go out in my kayak, and Ricky came out and said, Dad, I want to go kayaking. So in the back of my mind, I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity, time with my son, and get to do what I want and what he wants. You know, that's a twofer, you know, two for two. And so we were going to go out paddling, and it was windy. So, so we started paddling out, and I knew where we wanted to go, so I wanted to get there. So I'm looking, and I can see where the calm water is, and I just start paddling. And it's not long. I look back, and Ricky's 100 yards behind me. And it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, I thought you were having family time. And I had to rethink what I was doing. And one of the things I'm learning, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, is to treasure your treasures in life. <laughs> to, to start to put value on the things that are really important to you and quit valuing things like getting somewhere in a hurry. And instead valuing the people that are with you on the journey. And so I was trying to get there and I realized, oh, so I actually paddled back. Which is really hard when you're a goal-oriented person. <laughs> paddle back and, you know, are you doing okay? You know, and I didn't do a sarcastic thing. You know, you, a lot of times you paddle back and you go, are you all right? You know, I didn't do that. But, and then we paddled and we got to where the, there was calm and the fish were jumping and they were hitting the bottom of the boat. He's like, Dad, this is so cool. Got to talk to him. And, and that's when, by the way, if, if you're a guy, some of the best times if you want to spend time with other dudes is... If you can get somewhere where there's something to do, an activity together, and then you'll talk about stuff that matters in the middle of that activity. We have to look at those times in our life and realize, hey, how often are we in a hurry? And we're so much in a hurry that we don't allow God to work on us. 
or we're impatient with God. I actually had somebody come to me not too long ago, and they had lost a loved one. And it had only been a few weeks, and they said, I hope I'm going to get over this pain soon. You know, I, I should be, and they even said this idea, I should be over this by now. I'm like, uh, no, it's not how it works. Whether it's grief or a divorce or a struggle in your life or a loss of a job or a friendship that's broken down or, or something that's happened to you. We've got some guys even in our church who've gone through literal war in the military and they struggle with memories and other things. Hey, God will use time as you allow him to to change your life. But here's what I want to show you first. Here's why we don't like to wait. Number one, waiting, just like that video and obedience is painful. As I chose that video clip, Kyle and I were talking about it, and I said, you know, normally I choose a two minute video clip, two to three minutes. That one's four, and it seems like 30. <laughs> and as we talked about it, I said, that's the point though. Let's let it be really uncomfortable. Anytime we have to wait, it is uncomfortable. I don't, how many of you love waiting? You're just, that's your favorite, Thing. You're weird, okay? That's your fit, right? Nobody, nobody. I went to McDonald's last night in the big city of Port St. John. Trust me, I ate a salad that looked like a quarter pounder. Anyway, so... <laughs> Man, this salad looks just like a quarter pounder. It was two for five, and one of my kids wanted something that was on the five, and I, you know, I couldn't choose salad when I could get two for five. I had to, right? I could justify anything. Anyway, so 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And of course, I'm doing the evaluation. So they parked me. They parked me. That's when you know you're in trouble. And they go, hey, could you just pull up there? No. No, you just you pull up. And so I pulled up. I, I walked inside knowing I had just taught this sermon. And I said, I'm going to go inside so somebody doesn't have to walk out. When I walked inside, they said, sir, we'll bring it to you. Like I was going to yell at them. And I said, oh, no, no. I just I figured I would save you guys a trip. And they all looked at me like, you mean you're not going to yell at us for taking an extra seven minutes to get your, you right? As for a glass of water, I stood there and I said, you know what? This is just living out my sermon. Why get upset? It's not like I could hurry the chicken up. I got grilled chicken. That was the mistake, right? I got something healthy, right? <laughs> How often, though, do we miss those moments? We get in a fight in the car or, or yelling at people in the car when we could be spending time with our family. Number two, we think we'll miss an opportunity. This happens to people all the time, and I counsel people all the time. Maybe they've been through a bad breakup. Maybe they got fired from a job, and they, and they jump for something else. Or they quit a good job if that's not perfect because they have a conflict, thinking that they've got another opportunity before they ever have an opportunity. Number three, we don't realize that healing and growth takes time. I already talked about that a little bit. Number four, new things are exciting, and we use new things to numb our past. So this happens with people all the time that are getting out of one relationship. They go ahead and jump into another one because it's so exciting. They have something else to think about. And instead of dealing with their issues, they just numb what they've been through. A lot of people use drug and alcohol for the same thing. Number five, we compare our lives to others. So a kid gets out of college and his friend gets a huge job and all of a sudden he's dissatisfied. Or they want to buy, you know, a couple gets married, they want to buy a house instantly. Or they want all the furniture their parents had, so they go into a huge amount of debt because they don't want to wait. Now, this one's not in your notes, but it's on the screen. Number six, this is probably the most important one. We let our emotions control us. One of the most dangerous things you can do in life is answer to your emotions all the time. If you always react to how you are feeling, you are in big trouble. You can't even keep a job at McDonald's if you do that. And I love McDonald's. But if we let our emotions control us, we will ruin every relationship in our lives. So let's look today at lessons from the life of Moses. Last week, we looked at the Apostle Peter. We looked at how Peter blew it, and yet God could restore him. We talked about the importance of forgiveness. The week before that, we talked about owning it, why we need to own our part of the problems in our lives. So we talked about owning our problems. We talked about forgiving people who've hurt us. And even forgiving ourselves and what that means. And today we're going to talk about letting time heal you. Okay? So what happens when we rush decisions? Number one, we make bad, self-centered choices. And we've all done this. One day after, not exactly what Moses did, hopefully. One day 
after Moses had grown up, that's, he's about 40, he went out to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. Time out. Listen. Moses is second uh, uh, or, or right in line to Pharaoh. He's in Pharaoh's family. He's part of the family. And so he's there. He's important. He has a position. And yet listen what happens next. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. By the way, one of the dumbest things you can ever do in the desert is hide something in the sand. Because if you don't know anything about sand, it moves. And so hiding something in the sand, is, unless you're digging a big hole, it doesn't work real well, right? And so Moses makes this decision. Did you realize that Moses could have probably gone back? To his dad at that time who adopted him and said, hey, or granddad, hey, this guy was beating this guy. Can we make sure that doesn't happen? Can you punish him? And the guy may have gotten killed by Pharaoh. Instead, because he makes a rash decision, he ends up making a dumb decision. Why? Because he was in a hurry. He was in a hurry. I'll never forget being in Miami. My dad taught me a great lesson in Miami. We were, we were in on US-1, which in this one place in Miami is eight lanes wide plus a middle turn lane. So that's nine lanes. So if you go to turn left, you're going to pass at least four lanes of traffic, right? So we were sitting at a light on 112th Street, I think. That sounds about right. 112th and US-1 in Miami, turning left. My dad's about three cars back. And we see the person in front of us. The light is green both ways, so cars are going. And the guy's looking, and the guy goes to the left two lanes and then didn't see a car, so he stopped. And cars now in the next two or three lanes are going by him. And these two cars stopped. And my dad started saying, don't go, don't go. My dad taught me something that I do to this day is I talk to other cars, other vehicles on the road. I don't know if we do that, but I talk to people. I try to encourage them with my wisdom. Like, dude, you ran the stop sign, and now you pulled out in front of me. You were in a hurry, and now you're not. You're going below the speed limit. It would have been okay, but you ran the stop sign, right? I'm having a whole conversation with people who can't hear me, which is a sign of insanity. But anyway, so my dad's saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. Sure enough, the guy pulled forward into that third lane, and somebody nailed the front of his car. That car spun around, hit a car over here, hit two or three cars on this side sitting at the light. Bang, 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 just everywhere. Glass everywhere, stuff everywhere. And my dad, just without another breath, said, better to wait than get the slop knocked out of you. That's words of wisdom, kids. In life, so often we're rash to make a quick decision because of something in our lives, and we get the slop knocked out of us because we get in a hurry. Listen, if that person had waited literally five more seconds, the light was changing. They would have been able to go once everybody stopped, but they got in a hurry. And let me tell you, I can tell you right now, it took them weeks and maybe months of dealing with all that stuff. Why? Because of a few seconds they were in a hurry. Let me tell you the three A's and the three E's that get us in trouble. Here's the three A's. Arrogance, anger, and adrenaline. Arrogance, anger, and adrenaline. And the three E's that get us in trouble? Excitement, expectation, and emotion. The first one gets us in trouble when we're dealing with people and we get aggravated with them. The second one gets us in trouble a lot of times when we jump into something, whether it's a relationship or we see a job or we see the potential, and we maybe jump before we have to make a decision and we get in trouble. Number two, our judgment is flawed and yet we don't realize we need help. Haven't you ever tried to warn somebody about something and they just look at you like you are the dumbest thing they've ever seen? If you have teenagers, you've seen that look. Like, listen, I just want to tell you, you need to be careful of this. Okay, Dad. <laughs> right? And some of you, you talk to a friend and you try to warn them about something. You see something going on, you're like, you know, I'd be careful of them. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, okay, whatever. The next day. Moses went out, he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking 
of killing me as you killed the Egyptian. Now Moses thought he was okay. He thought he was fine. He, he, he didn't realize that anybody had caught him. And yet here he was. He was beginning to recognize or he was dealing with this idea that he thought he had great judgment. So much so that even though he killed a guy the day before, he still thought he was a great judge. Even though he could not see his blind spots, he thought he was better than he was. It's like those people on American Idol who think they can sing. <laughs> and you go, who told you you could sing? I don't know who they were, but if it was anybody but your mama, they should be in trouble. Your mama should tell you you could sing no matter what. Even if you're horrible, your mama should say, oh, that was beautiful singing. Thank you, honey. But your friends should say, you know, we've told you you could sing. But now that you're going to go try out for American Idol, we have to be honest, you're horrible. You're just horrible. Please don't sing in front of people, right? Our judgment can get flawed. And anger does that a lot of times. I was at a guy's house, and this guy was not poor by any means. Big house, two-story house. I'm at his house one day, and we're in the living room. And I'd been there several times, and we're in the living room, and I, and I, I kept seeing this door next to the living room and it had a hole right in the middle of it like a somebody had taken their fist and put it through the door and i said to him one day i said you know i can help you change out that door thinking that maybe i don't know he didn't know how or whatever and he looked at me he goes no 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 i leave that door there on purpose okay he said you have to understand it's a reminder to me to not get angry he said, I got mad one day at something, and I reached over, and I punched a hole in the door. And he said, and so I leave that door there so that every day I can remember what happens when I let anger control me. So he wanted to have better judgment in the future, so he made himself a reminder. Number three. We live in fear and negative thinking, and we reap what we sow. Listen to what happened. Then Moses was afraid. By the way, when you start jumping out and making decisions, one of the first things that happens is you make a decision, and you go, oh, I wonder if I should have done that. You go and you buy a car that you shouldn't have bought, and the next day you have buyer's remorse. And that company who said, oh, you got two weeks, when you show back up, they go, oh, no, no, we didn't mean that. We may have two weeks if something went wrong. What went wrong? Oh, I don't like the car. <laughs> Too bad. He was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard this, listen to this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Don't you hate it when you do something dumb and you get caught? When you say something, and as soon as it comes out of your mouth, you go... <laughs> Or you do something and all of a sudden you're busted. I'll never forget in Miami, I took a right, going to Dade Land Mall, took a right, there's double white lines and my friend's next to me in my 1973 convertible Mustang with a 351 yeah. Cleveland engine. And he says to me, dude, you can make it go. There's nobody here. By the way, this guy is now a colonel in the military. But anyway, so, so I went across three lanes of white lines in traffic to turn left. I look in the rearview mirror and three cars back. Yes, there he was. Officer going to give you a ticket. <laughs> I remember that feeling. It just washes over you. Not even the feeling that what you did was dumb, but the feeling like, uh, I'm going to reap what I've sown. <laughs> and I would have if it wasn't for Chinese tourists. I'll have to tell you that story another day. Here's a great thought. We are microwave people with a crockpot God. We're always in a hurry. God's not. And you try to rush God, and it's like going to the DMV. God's like, I'll get to it. And we feel like, God, what are you waiting for? Here's what he's waiting for. This is how time is our friend. Just like you can't go on an instant diet. I mean, listen, it takes years to build this up. There's a lot of quarter pounders that go into making this happen, okay? <laughs> It takes years to build this up, and you can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go on a diet and go to the YMCA. You can go to the YMCA and run for six hours, and then go home and go, oh, I lost it all. No, it takes time and discipline to undo something that's been done for years. Hey, the same is true in relationships. You can't wake up one day and say, I want to spend more time with my family. We've never had dinners together, so tonight we're going to have a six-hour dinner together. 
No, you don't get that time back. So what do you got to do? You make investments in time, little by little, and you allow God to heal you the same way. So what happens when God makes us wait? Maybe after you've been something, been through something difficult, whether it's a divorce or a hurt or a job situation, or whether you had a failure or somebody hurt you. Number one, we learn lessons and skills for our future. We pick up again Exodus chapter three. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, and you gotta love that name, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now listen to all of the things that are in these few sentences that Moses had to learn. Moses had to learn, first of all, how to be patient with people. Taking care of sheep requires patience. They are dumb. They do dumb things. They fall over when they're heavy, and the shepherd has to help them up. They can't even get themselves up. When they have a full of, uh, of uh, wool, when they fall over, they go feet up. Feet up. Can you imagine you're walking, and you're trying to take them somewhere, and you turn around, and there's like five sheep upside down? You're like... Right? And you're flipping them back over, and they wander off, they break a leg, you know, something happens, they let something gets to them. So he learned not only how to be patient, but how to shepherd. Why? Because he was getting ready to lead thousands of people in the same spot, to the same spot. He was learning about the desert. He was learning to have grace. He was learning all the skills of a shepherd. And here's what's interesting. He's shepherding the people of Israel, and later the Bible says that's what Jesus does. Did you know that? Sometimes that waiting time in life is so that you can learn about who you are. Sometimes it's so you can unlearn years of bad habits. Sometimes it's so you can relearn something. So I told you earlier, I'm learning this idea of treasuring treasures. And so in life sometimes, when you're in a hurry, a lot of times your family's in the car and you're yelling at them because you're worried about somebody and what they think or what, you're late somewhere. And you're not, you're not worried about teaching them discipline. You might use an excuse like, well, I just want you to learn to be on time. No, no. You're just mad because you're worried about what that next person thinks. And so the truth is you're treasuring somebody over here that you don't even really care about that much. And you're not treasuring the person that should be the most important to you. Let me give you an example. I was on the way to church this morning. This morning, today. So I'm on the way here. I left a couple of minutes early. I was so excited. I'm on my way here. I am almost to Grissom. And I get a text. Dad, can you come get me? And my first thought was, there's people waiting on me. Now you got to realize, we come to the point in the church now that people have said to me, please don't come early, you get sweaty and you stink. So please don't come early. We don't want to hug you when you're like, you can work and help after, but don't help before because nobody wants to smell you. So please stop, okay? So you got to realize part of that. But part of me thought, oh no, I'm going to be late and what will people think? That was my first thought. And then I said, whoa, 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 but what's the most important thing? They don't need me. Is there anything I have to do? Is there anything that won't get done if I'm not there? The chair didn't get up here. Oh, right? So I said, hold over. Yeah, I'll be right there. So I went all the way from 405, all the way back to the big city of Titusville, and came back. I was 30 minutes later than I would have been. No one died. My son and I got to talk about the game last night, got to talk about church, got to talk about how he's doing on the way here. Why? Because I treasured my treasure. In life, look at what you treasure and pay attention to those voices because they will always push you towards things that don't matter. And one of the skills you need to learn from painful situations is, am I treasuring my treasure? Number two, we discover God's plans for our lives. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw and thought the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I love this. Uh, I'm going to go over and see what this strange sight is. Why doesn't the bush burn up? I love that. It's such a guy thing. Like, uh, what's going on over there? Let's go check it out. Come on, sheep. You know. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, listen, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. By the way, I love that God calls him twice. And Moses said, here I am. In the hardest time in life, you learn about people. You learn about friendships. 
and you discover skills that you're going to need later, and God will use that in order for you to discover what he wants you to know. In those 40 years, Moses discovered his weaknesses. He had to think back on killing that guy years and years ago. He knew that he was going to be God's chosen person to lead the people out. But what happened? He blew it, and he thought, I failed. And yet God comes to him and says, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Listen, when God comes to you and he's trying to help you to change and to work through something in your life, the most important thing you can do is be available to God. Don't reject his discipline. Don't reject the time he uses. It's painful to go through stress. But learn the lessons and then rely on God to help you to take the next step. Because you have weaknesses. You have things that you have to learn and you need God's presence. Number three. We discover God's characteristics and power. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. And we just talked about that a minute ago. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then here's what God says. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. What happened? Moses came to the place where he realized who God was. He realized how powerful God was. He realized how awesome God was. And he realized he didn't even deserve to stand in God's presence. But here's what's awesome. When God said, Moses, in the middle of the hot desert, and maybe if it wasn't hot, in the middle of the thorny desert. Okay, maybe there were no thorns. In the middle of the snake-infested desert. Take off your protection. Take off your shoes. Take a step of faith. Stand in the sand. Because I'm here with you. I know when you're going through hard times in life that it's uncomfortable. It's never comfortable. God never uses the holy jacuzzi to make you better. The Bible says he uses refiner's fire. I don't know about you, that sounds a little uncomfortable. Refiner's fire doesn't sound like, oh, that's just great. It's like those hot stones, right? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about with the hot stones? Yes. Okay, thanks. That was a good answer. Are you ready for God to move in your life? You have to allow him to make you uncomfortable. And when you're uncomfortable, don't fight against him. Recognize who he is and take the step of faith that you need. Everybody needs a sandal moment. And the sandal moments are always uncomfortable. But if you refuse to do what God wants you to do next, you know what he does? He gives retakes. He won't fail you. He'll just let you try again and try again and try again. Number four, we are humbled when we, over time when we learn that God is gracious and he uses broken people. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He's looking at God and saying, God, don't you remember what I did? You've got a short memory. I mean, so just 40 years ago, God, I've been out in the desert taking care of sheep. I'm married. I have family now. I got sheep. <laughs> I've done dumb things. You can't use me anymore. Who am I? Listen to what God says. God said, I will be with you. Time out. Do you realize what God didn't say here? God didn't say, Moses, that wasn't a big deal. God didn't say, Moses, you have awesome skills. He didn't say, Moses, you've got to realize what you've learned over these last 40 years. No, no, you know what he said? Moses, none of that matters. I'm with you. I'm with you. I want you to know today, regardless of your mistakes and your failures, God can be with you when you take that step of faith. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you when you brought the people out of Egypt. And then he says, you will worship God on this mountain. Now, you have to realize, uh, as the story goes on, Moses still didn't believe God. God came back to him and kept telling him, I want you to go, I want you to go. And finally, at the end, Moses looks at God and goes, send somebody else. I don't blame him. He felt like he had failed for all these years, and God said, no, 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 I'm sending you. I'm sending you. But God, how are they going to know? And then God would give them another thing. God, how are they going to know? God would give them another thing. God, how are they going to know? God would give them another thing. And then he goes, uh, send somebody else anyway. 
Have you gotten to the point that you realize it's not about you? It's about God. He had to feel like a failure. Listen, we all wake up some days and feel like a failure. We all wake up some days and feel unloved and unlovable. But God wants to know that you, he is with you regardless of what happens. And here's the most important thing. Number five, we discover that God uses even our failures to do his will. Rick Warren says that your greatest ministry will come from your deepest pain. But I'm going to add to that if you will allow God to work on you. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in everything God works for the good to those who love him. There are people he called because that was his plan. Do you want your life to be better next year than it is this year? That instead of rushing through life and just doing what you have to do and just trying to get everything done in a hurry, how about you get still? How about you let God work in your life and even in the pain, that instead of rejecting the pain and trying to numb the pain that God has allowed into your life, that you embrace the pain and you go, you know what? That really was painful. I really made some mistakes here. I really had some failures here. That person really hurt me here. But God, you can use all those things because here's the thing. God will bring someone into your life who's struggling with the same thing you struggled with days or weeks or years ago, and he will bring them into your life so that you can encourage them and be a blessing to them, and then you can help to raise them up. Paul said it's the very things we've suffered through that we're able to help other people with and to comfort them. So what's your past? What's your failure? Who's hurt you? Time is not against you. Allow God to use that time to heal you. Don't get stuck. You can get stuck. Don't get stuck. But begin to say, God, I know you're with me. Would you help me to process this, to walk through this? And if you'll do that, God will use time to heal you and then use you to heal others. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step of faith is to say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. You can do that today. I'll be here. We're going to take our offering in just a minute. I'll be here after the service, and you can come up and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. I know about Jesus, but I've never given my life to him. Maybe you're here today, and you're a Christian, and you've got some really painful stuff in your life, and you've been running. I want to encourage you to begin to go back and say, God, I've never dealt with that. Help me to deal with that. Help me to stand before you and know that you're with me as I deal with the pain and the failure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for today. I thank you that when we step out in faith, when we take our sandals off and we stand on your holy ground, Father, that you come and you heal us. And not only do you heal us, you use us to be a blessing and even to minister to others through the pain and the hurt. Father, I thank you that in Scripture, you used a guy who murdered someone to write the first five books of the Bible and to lead the people out of Israel and to be an example of faith. And Father, you could use us regardless of what we've done, regardless of what's happened in our lives. You can use us if we step out in faith and trust you. So Father, we choose to do that today. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today or anybody watching online today, Father, that needs to give their lives to you, to surrender their will to your will, that today would be the day that they surrender to you. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for all that Jesus did for us. And Father, we choose to kneel at the cross today, to allow you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to do an old song, and it's got a great line in it called, I Raise My Ebenezer, and that was a reminder in Scripture that God helped the Israelites. And so when you say, I raise my Ebenezer, it's really easy to, to sing that and say, what in the world? But it means, I rely on God to help me. And so when you sing that today, just realize you need God's help. We all do. Thanks for being here this morning. You give what God's put in your heart.